Welcome to Sound and Vision, conversations with contemporary artists and musicians about the creative process. Here's the host of Sound and Vision, Brian Alfred. Sound and Vision is sponsored by Golden Artist Colors. Golden Artist Colors makes the best paint you can buy. You can find their products at any art store or online at goldenpaints.com. Sound and Vision is also sponsored by Fulcrum Coffee Roasters. Head over to fulcrumcoffee.com and check out all the different coffee varieties they have to order. And you can also check out their subscriptions. From $15 a month, you can order different coffees to be delivered to your door. Check out Fulcrum Coffee Roasters at fulcrumcoffee.com. Eric Fischel was born in 1948 in New York City and grew up in the suburbs of Long Island. He began his art education in Phoenix, Arizona, where his parents had moved in 1967. He attended Phoenix College and earned his BFA from the California Institute of the Arts in 1972. He then spent some time in Chicago, where he worked as a guard at the Museum of Contemporary Art. In 1974, he moved to Halifax, Nova Scotia to teach painting at Nova Scotia College of Art and Design. Eric had his first solo show curated by Bruce Ferguson at Dow House Art Gallery in Nova Scotia in 1975 before relocating to New York City in 1978. Eric's paintings, sculptures, drawings, and prints have been the subject of numerous solo and major group exhibitions, and his work is represented in many museums as well as prestigious private and corporate collections including the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Whitney Museum, the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles, the St. Louis Art Museum, the Louisiana Museum of Art in Denmark, the Musée Beauborg in Paris, the Payne Weber Collection, and many others. Eric has collaborated with other artists and authors including E.L. Doctorow, Allen Ginsberg, Jamaica Kincaid, Jerry Saltz, and Frederick Tootin. He is also the founder, president, and lead curator for America, Now and Here, the multidisciplinary exhibition of 150 of some of America's most celebrated visual artists, musicians, poets, playwrights, and filmmakers, is designed to spark a national conversation about American identity through the arts. The project launched on May 5, 2011 in Kansas City before traveling to Detroit and Chicago. Eric is a fellow at both the American Academy of Arts and Letters and the American Academy of Arts and Science. He lives and works in Sag Harbor, New York with his wife, the painter April Gornick. I spoke with Eric from his home and studio in Long Island about growing up in a turbulent home, finding escape through painting, not fitting in with hippies, his book about his life, and putting in the work, and much more. Here's our conversation. Okay, you're in Brooklyn, I understand, right? Yeah, I'm in Brooklyn. Okay. Still here. You found it. you 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 did it. You got you got out. You made a wise choice. Well, I I put my time in a long time ago, so You sure did. The, the getting out was a little easier. Yeah, well, can I can I preface this conversation with saying I was thinking about it. I rarely speak with artists who and have the advantage of reading a book about their life before I get to talk to them. So mm. it was really great to, you know, it's, I think it's going to shape the way I ask questions because normally I'm trying to go back in time and hear a little bit about, you know, how these people grew up, grew up and mm-hmm. what sort of brought them into a creative life. But I mean, I kind of I got your story, you know, there's a few missing pieces that I wrote scribbled down of like things that I'd like to delve into, but you okay. to say that your childhood was bumpy would be a, a subtle understatement. Yeah, I think the uh, the a lot of a lot of people's uh, lives are bumpy. A lot of pu- children's lives are bumpy. So it's it's not about that. I think that. Part of it is that within the 
the paradise of the new suburbia, it just wasn't supposed to be like that. <laughs> right. That wasn't so, the advertisement, right? For the yeah, movie. yeah. So you were dealing with that split between, uh, you know, two different worlds. Yeah, I guess I, I mean, I, I'd like to think I grew up in like lower middle class, but mm-hmm. it was so not idyllic that maybe the, you know, some of the rough spells of growing up just felt like, yeah, this is probably everyone's experience, you know? Mm -hmm. But um, I guess suburbia would do that. It creates this, you know, mirage of happiness. And in that era too, right? Mm -hmm. So that era of suburbia, when, you know, there's less information is out there and less stuff is out in the open public. Mm -hmm. A lot of stuff behind closed doors was really behind closed doors, which... Yeah, and it was, you know, the the optimism coming out of uh, World War II and this sort of new empowerment of the American dream and all of those things were very much woven into what the suburbs was supposed to be. Right. And uh, it, uh, it was very different. Plus it also, I think, changed some of the... Uh, you know the 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 structure, <clears throat> family structure in that. Uh, you, you know, usually it was the father that would take the commuter train into the city. So you you never sort of saw how they worked. Oh yeah, it was right? a mystery, right? Yeah, yeah, they'd go and then they'd come home. You know, be with you for a couple hours before you went to bed or something like. You know, it's like that thing. So mostly you grew up in the company of women. And uh, and you grew up in a thing not actually understanding the full sort of social structure. Yeah, and, it was a, uh, it was cloaked. I mean, my my dad worked double shifts, right? Hmm. So he was, was he around, in a steel but, mill, or what was he? No, he worked. He drove a truck for the uh-huh. not for the post office, but. He would drive a truck for an independent contractor from downtown Pittsburgh to like the airport or other areas. Mm-hmm. So he just lugged mm-hmm. around these giant steel bins of mail. Mm. And he worked from like 10 to 8, then 10 to 2 a.m., then 10 to 8, 10 to 2. So we only had these little windows where I'd see him. And uh, it was just, you know, I mean, he. And then I thought when I had a kid, I want to be around. Fortunately, I'm self-employed for the most part. I could be around more. And I yeah. wonder if that's a blessing or a curse for myself. <laughs> there's because there was plenty of days when I remember thinking like, uh, maybe he won't come home today, and it'll be just quiet, and I won't have to do chores or like listen to him yell at me about keeping my room clean or whatever, you know. <laughs> but yeah, that's that. You know, the the mystery of that. I was a latchkey kid too, so I didn't have. You were a what? A latchkey kid. Uh huh. Do you know what that, is that? that I've term? heard that expression, but I'm blanking on it. It's right just now. when I came home from school, I had a key. My mom worked too, so uh-huh. my brother and I were there, you know, to tour device, like just left alone for hours until they mm. came home, which was when fun. I I I wasn't a latchkey kid. I was a unlocked door kid. Yeah. You know, yeah, that's growing a thing up too, where we right? grew up, we we you know everybody's doors were unlocked. You'd run in and out of your friends' homes. You know, it was a you know your dogs weren't on leashes, right? It was just uh, you, you'd walk to school. You you know, in in uh, elementary school, you could leave school for lunch. They never asked you where you were going. You know? Different <laughs> different time, which is funny uh, because no technology then. To, to trace or keep track so i guess it was just like well you know it was such a different sensibility like my parents Mm -hmm. would always say just be home before it gets too dark yeah yeah it's probably more relaxing in a way on their part because they didn't there was no way to know until you show up you don't worry because you're right never because you're not answering the phone yeah exactly yeah yeah Yeah, that's a different but um the one thing that you know in reading about your youth that I think you alluded to it here and there, but there wasn't too much talk about music. And was music something growing up that was big for you? Was it in the house playing? Like, what was your... And you had a lot of siblings, so I imagine, you know, if there is music, you're getting influence and all that stuff. Well, uh, uh, my parents 
you know, we had record players, and, uh, and the parents would listen to either classical or, or uh, show tunes, um, you know, musicals, yeah, that kind of thing, so, some jazz as well. Um, but it wasn't like we, did, we talked about music, so it wasn't like I had a sophisticated sense of what I was listening to. So to me, it was always background. It was always, you know, adult music, et cetera. Uh, my sister, my, one of my sisters, who's 11 months older than I am, Holly, um, you know, we got a, a little record, portable record player for 45s and started collecting, you know, Elvis Presley and yeah, yeah. Gene Pitney and et cetera. So, you know, the whole sort of thing of 50s music. Right and whatnot, and I um, I had a radio in my uh, bedroom, and I would let it uh, play all night. I had yeah. a, you know, I just turn it on, and it, it was a, a way of sort of dealing with the scary darkness. Right, a uh, voice of comfort in the air. Yeah, was yeah. it what? What kind of music were they playing overnights? It was it was pop, uh, yeah. you know, pop record, you know, pop um, music station. So right. <clears throat> Murray the K and people like that. The the pre I mean I, I'm guessing that like rock and roll is just getting started, you know. Yeah, yeah. That must have been yeah. exciting though, at that point. Yeah, it was. Uh, I mean, it was really forming a way that uh, we would exchange with each other generationally. Right. You know, it was the you know talking about the the latest thing that come out or you know dancing we you know the the junior high school i went to they had sock hops which was like every friday after school for a few hours go and dance in the gym in your socks you know? yeah we had that too i wonder if they still do that because yeah. it was usually when it rained out it would just all of a sudden when the forecast was raining it'd be like all right it's a sock hop uh -huh. <laughs> you can't oh, wear yeah. your shoes your muddy shoes in the gym yeah right 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 so yeah, it was. It became a a, a real uh, uh, sort of part of the fabric of uh, weaving, uh, you know, a generational uh, connection to uh, to everybody. And then, as it moved into the '60s, and it moved into the you know big albums and stuff like that, where all the lyrics are printed on the back, and yeah. you'd sit around and you know read the lyrics, the, the latest, and you'd talk it became like your literature as well your poetry and right you know yeah, and like then of handbook. course <laughs> yeah and then, and then of course there were poets that, that were you know singing like dylan or cohen or Joni yeah. mitchell or paul simon etc so it was you actually would this is the way you received your poetry <laughs> right so. through song which is a great way to yeah ingest it now i feel silly asking but i mean were you a beatles fan was the beatles a big thing for you yeah, I mean, not, I never saw them live, so uh, I, I didn't go to that extent uh, of you know trying to get into Shea Stadium or right or whatnot. But I certainly listened to, and I, I think you know mo most connected, starting with like Revolver, and then of course like Sgt. Pepper and stuff. But, uh, yeah, that's a that's an entry point, right? Yeah, and it came at a certain time, a yeah. certain culture. <laughs> Was that it? Yeah. You weren't out in on the west coast yet at that point were you uh no i didn't uh, get out there till 67 um uh so yeah this was all happening uh you know on long island and uh, i went to a a prep school in maryland for a couple of years graduated from that so it was there too that was mid 60s yeah it sounded like that was a good escape for you it turned out to be, you know. I mean, that that, that was definitely back when uh, they thought there was only one way to learn, and so they had a, a rigid sort of educational structure that didn't take into account that you know people are wired differently, and <laughs> right. and that there might be another way that they would learn better. They'd be able to concentrate more and stuff like that. So yeah. And I didn't know why I was such a shitty student other than I was bored to tears and 
you know, just nothing really could have caught my interest in a way that allowed me to focus. Yeah. Isn't it amazing uh, that it seems fairly recent that they've sort of adjusted to that? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, as an and I, I'm confusing. not connected to, uh, I don't have kids, so I don't actually know how the structure is other than what I've heard. But, uh, but I think they're far more sensitive that, you know, there are different ways people receive and you try to sort of find out what that is and structure around that. So. Definitely. Yeah. It's, it's and much for me, it was a visual and language based. I, I was, a, I'm, I'm not a good reader. Uh, I have trouble concentrating for long periods of time when I read, but I'm a good listener and a, and a storyteller and, and, uh, you know, I, I, um, I get a lot of information. I, I guess I'm an even more old fashioned than I think I am, which is that I come out of the oral tradition. So <laughs> the storytellers, I go, I go back a long way to <laughs> campfires and yeah, yeah exactly. getting the information that way yeah. well i think a lot of visual people <laughs> I, well, maybe this is a gross overstatement but you know you it, it's difficult like if you think visually for me i don't read as much as i'd like to because when i have time i'm doing visual yeah. things and it's hard to you know do that and the audiobook thing is difficult because to your point like if you have trouble like reading and staying engaged in that text for you know 500 pages like how you know if you're visual and you want to do other things how can you concentrate on both of those things it makes yeah. it challenging it's it's actually why i hate to talk on the telephone well you're screwed in this <laughs> podcast <It's> been... <laughs> yeah but it, this is visual oh that's true that's true right yes. the, the thing about uh you know the uh you know unattached voice of a telephone yeah is something where you know the the voice enters your head directly, but your eyes are looking at whatever it's looking at, and That's right. and you know it's if if your eyes are a stronger sense for you, it's just harder to you know give it over to the the sound that's going on in the head. So it's funny I never thought of that, but that totally happens to me. Yeah. And like when I do for the few people that I talk to on the phone which is like family or, you know, a couple friends who are my age or older who are comfortable in that, you know, medium. I'm just always looking around distracted or it's, it's hard to just sit there. Yeah. And it's funny to watch younger kids do it. Cause when I hand my son the phone, if there's no video involved, he's, it, there's a level of confusion for a while of like, wait, mm -hmm. what, what am I supposed to do here? Talking this hole? <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, it's just a weird like, i mean it, getting used to uh, zoom is interesting too because of course <laughs> at least you feel like you're in a conversation even though yeah. you're not in the same space you're kind of in the same space at the right. same time yeah so you have that but you know it's it, it's hard not to be snoopy yes. right it's, it's hard not to notice you know fish bowls and paintings on walls and, oh yeah that's true you know boxing bags in your office and <laughs> like giving away all my secrets here <laughs> that's i should have put the blur i love the blur filter where you just blur your background as if yeah you're, it, it's the most i just unsubtle. learned that yesterday yeah <laughs> it's the most unsubtle like don't look at my mess tool that they have on this thing it's right, like, right i didn't have time to clean up because i just rolled out of bed so i'm just gonna hit this button and you will pretend that there's no mess behind me <laughs> right exactly yeah yeah, so your your education, I guess, you know, those difficulties with being a visual person, when you got out of school, you know, and you started to, like, oh, you went to, didn't you, you went to a school outside, south of Pittsburgh for a little bit, Yeah, right? in Waynesburg, Waynesburg College. Yeah. Is that, do you know, have you ever, do you know where Waynesburg is? I do, because I grew up in Carnegie, that's how we say it, we don't say Carnegie, Carnegie, uh, which is just outside of Pittsburgh, and it's mm -hmm. south on 79. And if you keep going down 79, you hit You come that. to Waynesburg. Yes. Yeah. You, yeah. And I, I think um, Falling Water is not, it's like down towards there. I mean, it's further east, but... Yeah, I never went there. I, I didn't know anything about it. Uh, you know, this was 1966. You weren't digging out Frank Lloyd Wright sites back then? <laughs> you know, I was, I, I really didn't even want to be in college. And right. so I... 
Uh, I was taking courses that were absolutely ill-suited for my sensibility without even know because I didn't even know I had a sensibility, but uh, it was one of those things that, uh, you know, the, the folks wanted me to go to college. Right. Uh, and so I did and wasted their money because <laughs> right. I flunked out. <laughs> Very they have good quickly. intentions when they do that, parents. You know, yeah, yeah. They're, they want the best. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's sometimes that you just got to let them do what yeah. they're going to do. You know? Some, so, sometimes they want the best in, in lieu of actually listening to you. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> right. It's it's so. that one way, just like teaching back then. It's like, this is the way. Yeah. You know, this, mold yourself to it. or yeah, Trust me, this will help. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, it, you know, it's funny because I think about that all the time because... Um, you know, I used, I don't do it anymore, but I used to coach kids soccer and I used to coach them just like my coach did, which was basically like the Marine Corps. I mean, right. you know, it was boot camp. Yeah. And then like, you know, if you can't do it this way, get out, you know, my way or the highway sort of thing. And then, yeah. you know, as in teaching and all that and having a kid, you start to understand, oh, there's different ways to, to get the best out of people. And mm -hmm. I, hopefully we're doing that a little more these days in general when it comes to you know, preparing kids for the future or just teaching, you know, and I've changed even in the, you know, not, I haven't been teaching that long, but I've definitely changed my sensibility. I used to be like, you guys got to be here sleeping here and working and you're on your phone all the time and, you know, complaining about all that stuff. And I realized that's not the way to do it. That's yeah. not the way to get through. You got to understand where people are coming from, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and you found obviously, you know, making art and painting was was a real voice for you right on how to come to grips with life everything that's happened where you came from and that struggle of like finding that but it, i talked to so many artists who making work is just this thing that they grew up drawing you know they mm -hmm. were good in art school or art class in high school or grade school and it just became this thing that like i just do this it didn't mm -hmm. doesn't sound like you necessarily had that path it's it's almost like you came into it later as mm -hmm. almost a solution not at the beginning it seems well i i uh, actually stumbled into it without knowing that i was looking for it and uh i had uh you know as i said i flunked out of college trying to take business courses and right. whatever practical <clears throat> application stuff and no aptitude for it and then and then it, you know it's the mid 60s and the whole sort of uh, you know alternate culture the the uh, hippie movement and stuff was just really coming into f a full focus the introduction of uh, psychedelics and you know the drug culture per se as a way to a kind of, you know, spiritual awakening and a, a, a different alternative lifestyle and right. all of that, which made a lot of sense to me. And, uh, and so I went out to San Francisco to try to become a part of that. And I think I kind of failed as a hippie, so. <laughs> it didn't take... I, <laughs> it, no, I tried, but it, you know, it's like s somehow the. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I didn't fail at the drugs, but I failed at the. Uh, you know, the, uh, trying to uh, embrace a whole lot of people that I didn't like, right? And and I couldn't get past that, and of course, felt bad about myself for not being cooler. So. <laughs> <laughs> why why do I not want to be part of this club? What's wrong yeah. with me? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> anyway, so when I went I by the the time I decided I was out of there, my folks had uh moved to Phoenix, which I'd never been to. And I I went back home to see if I could put myself together some other way. And uh I ended up uh getting a uh, a job delivering lawn furniture and there was a guy there who was taking art classes at the local junior college and we became friends and and uh, I'd never been around an artist and uh, 
I had very strong, you know, very conservative academic ideas of what art should be. Of course. And of course, his thing was about creativity. And so it was about, you know, doing whatever. Right. And that that ignited a, a, an interest in it. But I, I didn't see myself as an artist, but I saw myself as like, well, if I go to this junior college, I can meet more people. Maybe I could even find a girlfriend, you know, and yeah. and I'll take art classes because if you're shitty, they still give you a C, right? Yeah, so easy, you're not going to fail again. Grade. Right. You just have to show up. <laughs> yeah, but uh, but what I found was something I didn't know what I was looking for, which was, and and I wrote about this in in my uh, book. But I I found two things. One is that I could concentrate for the first time in my life. I could spend hours working on whatever project the teacher had given, and uh, with with focus and and energy and you know curiosity, it just opened my mind up in a way I'd never felt before. And the other was that I was not afraid to be alone, and yeah. uh, and so I could be in my room for hours without having any sense of the outside world at all. And, right. uh, and I, I, I didn't know whether I was an artist, but I knew that I, I should try to become one because this is, this is something that meant more to me than anything else that had ever happened. And I didn't know whether I'd be a good artist, but I certainly was committed to trying to be as good as I could be. Yeah, and you probably felt comfortable in that sense of, oh, I can I can do this and focus on this and just be content working hour after hour. You know, that's a big moment, I think, for artists who are truly love making it. It's like whether you, you go to class and it's a three-hour-long studio and after class you want to stay and work some more. Like, mm -hmm. that's that's a big moment of realization that, oh, this is something that I might want to do you know and the thing is is like it sounds like you were escaping a little bit or trying to get away from that uncomfortable home experience and like to escape to a community college where you're taking classes you don't like it's probably isolating and felt really lonely and kind of like depressing but if you're escaping into the studio where you feel interested and, and driven and compelled mm -hmm. by what you're doing that must feel like the ultimate you know 180 from that feeling yeah for sure, and and also it was something that uh, the the people that I hung out with at the school, the the people in my class that we gravitated towards each other, <clears throat> was a, a really a perfect combination of um, respect, delight, co competition. You know, there, yeah. it was one of these things where you, you got together with the energy and, and focus of wanting to blow each other's minds. Right. And, uh, and so it was, you know, constantly kind of one-upping each other with, you know, holy shit, you did that? Oh, well, okay. Yeah, yeah <laughs> I get like it. A, a good competition in a way. Yeah, right? no, it was very healthy. I, I highly recommend uh, that kind of competition in uh, young art students oh yeah I, we had the for me it was not only just what you're doing because a lot of us were doing stuff that was so different it was the work ethic too of like when i would leave the studio you know my my roommate was still there working and then i wake up and get to the studio and he's there working i'm like what the hell like he's i gotta yeah. step it up mm. and be yeah. there too you know like he's he's here all the time i and it just breeds this kind of like work ethic and and drive that's Mm -hmm. You know, I guess it's healthy. I don't know. It kept me out of it. And that's the question. The unanswerable question for you is where, what happens to Eric if he doesn't find that, if he doesn't bump into art? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you ever well, think about you'd it? You'd be that, looking at a dead man. Oh, geez. I, yeah. didn't mean it. I didn't mean for it to go that dark. <laughs> no, no, but it's true. Yeah. 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 You got to find, you know, that outlet, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I don't necessarily mean dark, uh, 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 dead in terms of physically, although that was certainly a possibility. But uh, 
but in terms of brain dead or, you know, just something where you, you, you just, you know, you sleepwalk through life. Right. And uh, I, I terrified of that, so. I, I agree. And I feel like a lot of people, there's this, you know, age old idea of like, oh, artists, that's tough. You you can't make money. You can't, it's a hard, which it is hard, but I feel like a lot of times artists feel this other sense of um of kind of like comfort and that like we found what we love to do and those people who are working the day job making a lot of money who are miserable that's really like you know a jail Mm -hmm. a prison Mm -hmm. in a way and you you see a lot of people who just can't seem to find that thing that they love and they try to like fill it with other stuff or buying stuff or whatever you know fills that hole but you definitely feel like there's a hole there that uh, i think a lot of people who are creative who make things are that, that that fulfills that in some way not that yeah. it's easy but it gives them that that goal or that outlet yeah well i i think uh you know important for your listeners to <clears throat> un, to know in terms of the difference between now and then yeah then being when i uh, came up through schooling and uh the entered the art world that uh, you know, fame and fortune weren't connected to each other. So right. y- you you committed yourself to a way of being in the world that wasn't based on the success, uh, the financial success. Uh, you kind of knew that you know you're probably going to do two jobs, three jobs. You're going to you know find something that doesn't interfere, doesn't exhaust you, so you can go home and paint for a few hours or something right at the end of the day yeah but that you know you you knew what your priorities were and uh and making money was only uh, about sustenance you know to allow you the time to actually do the thing that you were really you know committing your life to which was creativity and expression yeah definitely and well, I think culture it's so hard now because not only with the information out there of like this expectation of success or being able to make money off it or whatever there's also the added difficulty of like let's say if you move to new york or los angeles the cost of living the amount of loans people have like it, the stakes probably seem so much higher it's so much harder to just be freely creative because you're like oh shit i gotta immediately get into like succeeding so i can afford to live well, you know the the arts what got connected to the university structure <clears throat> back when the universities were focused on liberal arts yeah and liberal arts was you know art wasn't meant to be a major it was meant to be something that exposed you to a way of understanding culture and and stuff like that as as well as all the other uh, courses you took uh, that were in the liberal arts, and then like everything else, it became specialized right. and siloed in that way. And so now universities are about, you know, you're you're an engineer, you're an architect, you're a lawyer, you're a doctor, you know, blah blah blah. And the the crime was that uh, and is that they consider art to be comparable to that as a profession so they don't feel like guilty about charging them the same fucking amount of money <laughs> That's so true. that they that they yeah. do for somebody that actually could go out and have a financial career a doctor a lawyer a engineer that uh can maybe pay those loans back in a reasonable amount of time. Right. Yeah, that's and, true. And, you know, I, I think, you know, first of all, I think the, the structure uh, of art education is all wrong anyway because it's, you know, you're, you're basically trying to teach an art student how to make their first work of art. You're not teaching them how to make their second or their 150th or their 50 years later thing. But you're trying to teach them their, how to make their first work of art. Right. 
And for different students, that takes a different amount of time. Yes. You know, I'm sure you've had the experience where there's some student that you're working with that he could leave school a year from now and be, and be okay. Definitely. You know, because yeah. he, he understood the basic way of how you generate problems for yourself, how you solve problems for yourself, the, you know, whatever the technical things you can, you can absorb fairly quickly or, and master over 10 years instead of trying to master them artificially in two or three. Yeah. So you have all of that. And, and, uh, and then there are other students, they could be there for eight years and they're still not going to find themselves. Right. You know, they're going to be proficient at a craft aspect of it, but they're not, they're not never going to be an artist. And so how, how do you structure something where you have a four-year program and, and then a two-year program right. when what you have is you have a variety of people that, that learn and excel at different rates? So. Yeah, it's really, it's, it's difficult. It's trying to frame something that's really doesn't have four sides. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's yeah. this malleable way that people learn in that or organically grow as an artist that is hard to put that time stamp on. There's some artists too who, you know, they, it takes them like five years after school before they start, you know, blooming or it, they need yeah. time after no, all took, those voices. It took me seven to really get into what it was that I was, how I was going to be the artist I became. So. Yeah. Yeah, and back then, you you know, you if if you're driven, as I was, I, I was driven to be a part of the the larger culture. Yeah, I was as I understood it. I was I was driven to be, to excel, and uh, and uh, I was also absolutely uncertain of what the hell I excelled at and you know part of the the you know four of those years were about learning how to get rid of what I was taught and uh, and then you know trying to learn the language of what I was to become right and uh, you know shifting I I was Taught as a at a time when uh, painting was devalued to the point that it was literally declared dead. Right. And uh, I, I think for you know painters don't actually have a choice. You know, the, it's a way that they organize information. The way they organize, and I say they, I mean we. I'm right. in that category as well. It's the way we process the world and uh and so it, you can't take it away from a painter you you can devalue it in terms of the contemporary dialogue yeah yeah the you know the museum focus or the you know uh um, critical focus but you actually can't take it away and and so you know, when I was at school, and uh, it, they were pushing, if you couldn't get rid of it, if you couldn't stop being, and, and I certainly tried other ways, uh, you know, video art was just beginning, and yeah. performance, installation, all those things were just starting, so I tried my hand at that, but always came back to painting. But uh, the school was like, well, if you, if you can't not do it, then at least you should do abstract art. <laughs> because abstract is more contemporary right than imagery figuration etc so you know it took me several years after i got out of school to get rid of that prejudice and even though i i love abstract art and i and i think it's invaluable as an educational tool for those who don't become abstractionists because it certainly is the bones of uh of composition yeah for sure and uh and so it's important for everybody but you know it took a while to shed that uh you know ludicrous prejudice that i had inherited maybe that's and, uh part of the education though and i mean couldn't art schools sell it that way it's like look 
we're going to be four years of this sort of dogma and then you're going to have to go out and kind of like spend four to ten years exercising the demons and that's really valuable. So Yeah. So you're edu- yeah, and I you're think, you know, I mean, the, 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 the European model in a lot of cases is based on the idea of a master. Right. And you, you choose to work with that master because you want to sort of absorb what their mastery is, the wisdom of their mastery. Right. And so you're heavily influenced by them, which is okay, but you're expected to let go of it and find your own voice and become your own master and you know at some point if you're if you can and uh that's one of the reasons i stopped teaching i i was teaching right out of school like two years after i got out of school i i got a job that i didn't even apply for so this is halifax right yeah yeah and uh and I wasn't much older than the students, and I w- certainly wasn't formed as an artist, so I was teaching them what I had been taught, how I w- had been taught, et cetera, et cetera. But one of the things that drove me crazy was that each of the students was doing a very different kind of work, very different kind of painting. Yeah. And they would come to me for help as though I actually understood (laughs) how to solve their problem, you know, when they were doing a, uh, you know, hard edge minimalist, blah, 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 or they were doing some kind of a process-based schmear, or they were doing something, you know, I mean, it was just, they they were looking at artists outside of the faculty, of the school for inspiration rather than looking at the faculty for inspiration. And and then they were expecting you to be an expert in Robert Ryman's work or an expert in Saul LeWitt or an expert in, you know, Janet Fish or, you know, it's et cetera, whatever. And it 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 was something that after four years uh, I realized that, that you know, I didn't I wasn't an expert. I wasn't helping them in any way because I couldn't really talk to them about you know what what they're going to do to make their second painting. Right. You know, what what is it going to take going along these lines that you're pursuing that you're actually going to be able to make that second painting. And uh and so I, you know, I I got discouraged and left. Do you, do you think part of it was because you were just out of school? Because I think when I first got out of school, A, I can't imagine teaching at that point. And B, I think I would have the same problem that I think is a, a major problem of a lot of teachers is that they go into studios with their own work and sensibilities in their head. Whereas I think when you go into a studio, when you're teaching, you try to leave your taste and your relationship to your work outside the door and you try to understand what they're doing and where they're coming from and maybe ask some questions as an aesthetic outsider that can trigger them to think about their work in a way they normally wouldn't think about but it alleviates you from having to be an expert in their way of working so mm-hmm. you know what i'm saying like do you think if you were to teach these days you would bring a broader scope of your experiences to give them something valuable to think about when you know you well, I, I do teach. Uh, oh, you do? I, I, I didn't know. Yeah, that. I, I have a relationship with the New York Academy, and uh, which I've had for many years. And I, uh, you know, go in once a semester and critique, or nice. twice a semester and critique. Uh, I, it, it's not teaching in the same way in that day to day hand holding. You know, sitting sitting through crying spells and and you know nurturing uh, kind of thing, but right. but to the way you were describing your approach is similar to the way I do. I I I don't. I, I most of the work I actually when I'm looking at it, I my first reaction is I have nothing to say about this. And, you know, and then, and then trying, because I feel obligated to be respectful of their efforts, 
trying to find something that might be helpful or observant anyway, and try to get, uh, you know, ask questions that generate answers and questions from them, et cetera, would be the, the approach I had. But, and, and in that case, the, the, the difference between uh, the academy and, and uh, other art schools is that you, you don't start with first making an argument for figurative work right. because that's what they're all there for. So you take that argument away, right? So it's not about in the history of art, you know, right. we got rid of this in, you know, 1906, and, you know, blah, blah, right. blah, blah, you know. Uh, you start with other issues that are more directly related to painting to uh, in terms of uh, rendering and, and in terms of uh, imagery and narrative and things closer to to home for me so right. yeah. but it it still is you know I'm still dealing with a lot of students that aren't looking at my work to be inspired by so I'm having to sort of sort through what do, what do I know or care about surrealism? Right. You know, what is it really? <laughs> what? Do, any, right. Anyway, uh, yeah, I could no, go I, on. I'm I'm a little more unencumbered by students wanting to make work my, like mine. Like they don't. Mm -hmm. That's not even an issue. I don't know. I think that's probably, and not to get into weeds in it, but I think that's what makes you a great artist is that you are so in your world, in your visual world and indebted to the way that you're thinking about your work and moving through it. That sometimes it sounds like, you know, like you'll have that moment of like, well, what am I going to say about like, how am I bringing what I know and what I'm thinking about into this? Mm -hmm. Whereas I think I'm maybe I'm a little more surface or something. I just like, yeah, I, you can't get me to not talk about crap. <laughs> I'll just keep right. going and going, you know. Abstraction, uh, I love it. Like uh, yeah. my students probably think it's weird that I talk about Schwitters so much. Like, what is this guy? Like, he makes work that looks like this, but he's talking about Agnes Martin and you know Kenneth Nolan and Kurt Schwitters or Picasso's, you know, all that stuff. So, yeah. Well, I I hope your listeners don't get me wrong. It's not that I think that you shouldn't be compelled by, interested in, articulate in looking at other art that you don't do. Of course, yeah. And, and getting it, because it, it all fuels a lot of, uh, you know, the, the energy of the moment and the, the way you might, you know, find ways to solve some of the problems in your own work, et cetera, right. et cetera. So I don't, I don't mean that, but, I, but in terms of, uh, you know, the, the specificity of what I would teach versus you know a curriculum kind of idea about teaching i i'm not there i, th I think the best uh, uh thing i did at the academy was i i did a seminar class where each uh, I, there was five sessions and each week i brought in somebody who was absolutely connected to narrative work but from all different mediums. So, yeah. uh, so I brought in a, a, a theater film director to talk about setting up a scene. You know, yeah. I, I brought in a cameraman to talk about how you set up compositionally, how you set up something. A lighting person, how you do that. A, a playwright in terms of you know interaction between characters, etc. And there, so they were all parallel creative uh, uh, disciplines to parallel to narrative painting. Yeah. But something that, you know, we could all learn by right. and apply to, to sort of a lot of the problems that painting gives us. So It's a great move. I always feel like it's easier to tap in when you bring a parallel medium. Like I'm always talking about music with students of how... Mm -hmm you know, trying to bring a relationship to music because although it's totally different in a lot of ways, there's something freeing about thinking about music and that creative process as opposed yeah, to just, yeah. it's always about painting or sculpting and other things. Mm -hmm. 
but yeah, that's a, it's a whole different, I mean, I don't understand uh, the, the, a question that I have for you is like, how did you navigate that eighties phenomenon of like, it just feels like such a powder keg compared to maybe today, you know what I mean? Of, of like the scale, the sort of intimate scale of the artist working and, you know, and I read the book about the, the dynamic between, you know, the dealers and like who was where and it's all really compelling, but it just feels like it, I mean, maybe, you know, you had to cope with it in certain ways, but it just, it seems really difficult. Well, well first of all, the eighties didn't start in the eighties. So there's our it, quote uh, from the podcast. <laughs> there's our there's our headline quote. The yeah. 80s didn't start in the 80s. No, it didn't. It started it started with a, a, a artists working in the 70s who were breaking free of the hegemony right of uh, of abstraction of of you know minimalist abstraction and even of conceptual art. Right. And uh, they were a, a generation about you know ten years older than me, eight years older than me, that were beginning to do things where they were trying to figure out how to to reintroduce some aspect of imagery into a the purity of an abstraction. The, yeah. the Robert Moskowitzes and Susan Rothenbergs and and Joel Shapiro's, uh, David Trues, etc. Uh, there was a whole Borofsky. Uh, they were also with people like Elizabeth Murray and stuff. They were, they were, and and Borofsky as well. They were, they were trying to find. Uh, uh, you know, they they were starting to move into an identity quest. Yeah, which became full blown as uh, as the uh, underlying ambition for. Uh, art in the 80s it was you know trying to find out who we are as as individual as gender as as race as you know etc cetera, etc cetera, all the things that are manifest now and uh and so i was looking at the their work in the uh, mid 70s and stuff as i was trying to figure out what the hell i was going to do who was I? And, and I began to play around with narratives that began to move into, uh, uh, you know, first uh, terrifyingly into autobiography right. as a way of uh, uh, what I felt like was uh, the, the, I, I need to find something that. Uh, couldn't critically be taken away from me, right? So it's a, it's like paint what you know, exactly. Right? It's let's, like in let's here. do that. So how do you argue? They, how does anyone argue with that if it's coming from? Yeah, from it, it, they can dismiss you, but they can't take it away from you. Exactly. Right. And I was willing to take that risk of dismissal, and uh, and at the same time, I was my generation, my peer group. Now in full-blown sort of uh, a defiance of the the restrictions of uh, the you know art history of the last twenty years before us, uh, were flaunting everything that that um, you know we shouldn't be doing. We were really bad boys and bad girls and right. stuff. So yeah, yeah. so we were you know willfully doing bad paintings. And we were willfully introducing imagery and, and willfully introducing sensationalist imagery into it. And, uh, and so, and I was, I was he hearing that, you know, that was part of the things that were being talked about amongst us, that were being uh, demonstrated amongst us. And uh, I certainly wanted to be a part of it. And so I, uh, I pushed my work into, uh, my early work into a kind of a, a sexual um, expose of some kind. I was so stupid that I, I, rather than try to simply draw on, you know, like 
outright pornography or something as a, a you know something that's just about sex and and creates a stir when you see it and right. you know whatever i was actually trying to figure out a relationship to sex and to sexuality and and whatnot that took me into uh, uh the uh, sort of iconography and, and language of prepubescence took me into an area that I was most familiar with, which was the suburban uh, world, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and I, I did a show uh, that had these paintings in it that I thought well, this is it. I'm I'm going to be uh, thrown out of the art world for this stuff. It it, it yeah. broke even rules that I had upheld in terms of what makes good art or intelligent art or whatever. And and uh, and I thought the feminists would be all over me for the the imagery. And uh, you know, I thought the. Uh, you know, just the the general critical uh, uh, atmosphere would just destroy me. And oddly enough, it was the opposite that happened. It's it seemed like the this work that I did opened up a whole thing that uh, I, people were looking to be open. And, do you think? Uh, it, do you think it was the the realness of it in a way of of the way that it tapped into like day to day as a, as opposed to some sort of sensationalized imagery? Like there, it's almost like a weird um, parallel, but like horror movies that are based in reality are way more scary than like the fantastical. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Like it, it would just yeah. seem, felt a little more. Those images feel a little more something that's next door. You know. Yeah. I, I think that's uh, true, and I th I think also that you know one of the sort of the bottom line of uh, of art and the bottom line of people looking to art is that they are looking for authenticity. Right. They they want to to see something that reflects them in some authentic way that gives them a, a language or an image or a handhold or so, something that they feel connected to because it hits them in a very real place. And, and certainly that was, the, my ambition was to be as frank and, and honest as I could be about the experiences that I was trying to capture and depict. Right. But, this is at a, a, a time when uh, the art world seemed to be not, you know, much more focused on not an emotional, uh, psychological footing, but on a conceptual, intellectual, uh, a historical sense of what modernism is supposed, how it's supposed to progress. Right. And so this was absolutely disruptive to that. And the only thing I can say about my, the scale of my success at that moment was timing. Yeah. And it was not necessarily timing that I was fully aware of. Right. So I, it wasn't like I was strategizing to to uh, hit big. It was something that I was, the things that I was dealing with fit into the zeitgeist in a way that I, I solved some of the problems that, uh, that we were struggling with uh, or revealed anyway some of those problems that we were dealing with, but it, it wasn't predetermined, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and so, you know, how do, how do you, you know, pass that knowledge on to younger <laughs> artists. It's, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in people, you know, uh, finding, uh, beginning to feel what their zeitgeist is. Right, right. 
and help to find the language to articulate the zeitgeist. And, uh, and so that's, a, that's certainly a part of it. But uh, Part of that's unconscious, know. though, isn't it? Didn't Baudelaire say that like an artist to be of one's time, has to, it's like an unconscious representation of yeah. your age, you know? So it's hard to, to plan that. Uh, I, you know, Mel Bachner, who taught me when I was in school, used to have this expression of, as an artist, you come up to the river of making art, and it's a flowing river that's been flowing for hundreds of years, you know, and you just enter at that point, which is now, or like when you start to jump in, and it's going to keep going, and you're just, your entry point is your entry point. You can't change that, you know, and it's kind of like, to to your point of, you know, you it's it's difficult. You almost have to be unconsciously making work that you're inspired by that just happens to lock in with a sensibility of what people are engaged with, whether that's if people are irritated by it or they're embracing of it or it makes them ask the right questions or the wrong questions, but that's something that triggers, you know, something. In like Warhol did that. I mean, he came in and he made that work and I'm sure people felt the opposite of the work that you're talking about where it comes from, at least on the surface of something that's, you know, telling a, a personal story or something that's from within, he was very much about reflecting society and being a mirror to but, what was yeah, going on. The thing is that Warhol became the most poignant now. Right? Yeah, right? Of like, he, like of his generation, he was, you know, it's only in looking back at what he was doing, where you see the brilliance of it, right. and that, and that, uh, at that time, there were other artists that had far more cachet. You know, Oldenburg, for example. Right, right, right. You know, etc. Yeah. And uh, and so he, he, Warhol, actually is answering questions of a generation of artists that. Uh, Sort of came in in the late eighties, nineties generation of artists went through and are still dominating a lot of the art world now. But right. somehow Warhol represented that part of part of it is that uh, my my generation came out of the uh, you know the 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 mythology of abstract expressionism. Right. And uh, a mythology that grew out of that had to do with the artist as outsider and the artist as a, uh, you know, something that, that looks back into a world that they're not connected to. Right. And sees it and, uh, and shows in their you. own way and right. shows you, right? Yeah. And then it pees in your fireplace. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but the... Uh, the thing is, is that by the time we came into the the art world, it was changing in a way that, you know, we were making money and we were becoming famous very quickly. We were be, we were being put in the, on the same pages with rock stars and celebrities and right. things like that. And it's like, wait a minute, how am I an outsider, right? And and then you realize that Warhol had the answer because because Warhol was absolutely an insider, absolutely comfortable with wealth, absolutely comfortable with uh, you know glamour, et cetera, et cetera, and was a total wacko. Right. You, you know, an he introvert. was he was the most eccentric insider yeah and somehow that became like a way of understanding how you could navigate the craziness which was this uh this world that we were not only inhabiting but helping to uh to develop so right it's pretty genius i, yeah. I love that you know i walk around you know chelsea and or go to lower east and go to galleries and that i see a lot of you know like figurative painting you know it, it always goes into that like there's you see a little more of one kind of work for a few years and then you'll see more abstract, whatever it is. And, yeah. you know, with a lot of figurative work going on that I, I see elements of your work or, you know, like what you've inspired and the work, the kind of work that you make in younger painters, which 
I, I wonder how you feel about that. I'd imagine that's well, a good thing, right? I, I I love hearing that. I don't know. I, I'm it's I, I'm not that up to date on what's going on in a lot of the galleries. Uh and uh you know, pretty isolated by a lot of that. So uh, I don't actually see a lot of the work that I would say, oh, look, that that person's taking the ball and running with it. <laughs> How cool is that? Right, you know? right. But uh, uh, so I don't, so yeah, if you have names to attach to what you're talking about, send them to me. Yeah, so I'll well, look up the work <clears throat> to find out. Yeah, I will. I mean, I even had a really talented student a couple of years ago who I remember him working on this, you know, when you're in art school and you decide like, or you come under the realization like, wow, I can make this painting ginormous. Like I can make a huge painting. And it's like yeah. a revelation that you can actually, do. I mean, it's a pain in the ass, but you got to go down and build the thing and all that. But you can make this giant painting. And he had that moment. And, you know, I, was, I love walking into the studios when they're not there and seeing what they're looking at, you know. And there mm -hmm. were some of your paintings printed out, like, you know, printouts and as inspiration and you know amongst a lot of other stuff but right um it just it was a cool moment of seeing that and yeah. thinking like oh yeah looking back to other work and that dialogue that exists is is kind of cool yeah um That's good but yeah i don't to be honest with you like lately i'm not that great at going around the galleries either well especially since covid you know it's kind of mm -hmm. locked us all into place and i would imagine judging by reading your book the travel has really you know inspired you and, and given you a lot of sort of impetus and, and you know seeing work like that all over the world and in museums and different cultures has you know open doors in a way for all of us but you haven't really been able to travel well, none of us have been able to travel too mm -hmm. much lately is that something you're still doing or pining to do, or have you settled down with the travel? Uh, well, uh, it's hard to say because of COVID, whether I've settled down. I mean, we, we actually were fortunate enough to go to France a couple of months ago. So oh, nice. Before they had to close down again. <laughs> I know, it's like on and off. <laughs> and right? it was and it was, uh, it was wonderful and to you know go to the museums and see a lot of work that I was revisiting or a lot of work that I hadn't seen. Yeah, that was, that was good stuff. But uh, the thing about uh, travel, I think Joan Didion said that, uh, you know, when you travel, you go into a, th a place where the first thing you know is that you don't know. Right. And so what you do is try to find your way to the center of it so that you can understand what it is that you're experiencing. So it's a, it's a naturally uh, inspiring, provocative, uh, um, energizing experience to, to go to unfamiliarity. Yeah. And, uh, and so I, yeah, no, I've found it was very... Uh, uh, helpful in a lot of ways, and uh, and it was also for, you know I, I I think the first big travel that I did I, I traveled to Europe, but the first place where I went where it was absolutely foreign was Japan. Uh, I, I enjoyed your writings about it. I I live in a Japanese family, so oh, I go uh -huh. there well pre pandemic. Uh -huh. Pretty much go every year, and I've taught there, and I, I liked your your comments about the culture there. But go no. ahead. Well, I, I'm not going to quote myself because I don't remember what I actually <laughs> said, but I, I probably will say the same thing now. But uh, anyway, I uh, the the thing is that what I found in Japan was a, a culture that was so advanced, sophisticated in terms of its representation of itself right the way the way th there was so much about the culture that was all about presentation and uh that i couldn't find another way to see it right. it was it was so sophisticated so deeply historic uh, historical in its in a, in its development it, it, everything about it was something that made it really hard to to penetrate 
Yeah. Uh, except from an appreciation of it. Right. Right. From the outside perspective. Yeah. yeah. And then the next place I went was India. And India was so chaotic, <laughs> and sensorily chaotic, yeah. uh, with such variety to it, such kind of extremes in terms of, uh, you know, smells and tastes and colors and shapes and et cetera, et cetera, that there were, it, it was like a, a great opportunity to represent it, you know, to try to make sense out of it for myself. And even though I had uh, gone there without any intention of, painting it i when i came home that's all i could think about was how to to get this experience in some kind of order for me right and uh and i think that that's a, a an important aspect of you know the creative uh experience the creative travel the whatever is you're you're looking for things that overwhelm you right in whatever for whatever reason but they overwhelm you and then and then trying to put that into some kind of order is where the act of representation takes place so yeah it's really interesting how that affects the way we see and experience and like for me going to japan it's such a personal resonance because i i have family there and we go to houses i think before i've been personally involved you have a different perception but then when you relate to something in a more one-on-one -on -one way some of that veneer is dropped and you get to see the behind the scenes of it you know yeah. What I mean? yeah it'd be like visiting a hollywood set and then actually being an actor on the set you know right. totally different understand or actually being in the art world like thinking to yourself oh i'd like to be a painter and then going to new york and dealing with dealers and collectors and it's a whole different thing it's a much right. different on the outside, you see it as a certain way when you walk into Gagosian and you see the artwork and the people working there. And yeah. then behind the scenes, right? Mm -hmm. That's always a, a little bit of a an abrupt shift. <laughs> yeah. As, as any yeah. young student who goes to work at a gallery as a, uh, a gallery desk attendant will say, like, oh, it's totally different than I imagined what it was going to be. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so uh, a couple more questions, if you don't mind. One is, when you're working, do you work in silence? Do you listen to audiobooks? Do you listen to music? What's your, or is it vary? Uh, I, I don't listen to audiobooks uh, when I'm painting. I, I listen to music pretty much constantly, and it depends on what it is. It, uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, it's I just hit a, a song in my in my iTunes, and then it shuffles through right. my library or shuffles through their thing with like yeah. stuff. So, sometimes algorithm. I listen to uh, you know an album. It's a, a range from uh, popular music I grew up with and still inspired by uh, music that uh, you know sort of alt music now yeah um class some classical music some music that was more contemporary classic things like that did you ever collaborate because i'm sure speaking of the 80s and uh, to your point of like you know this thing like artists that you were in that circle with of knowing you know people and going out to places where everyone's mingling did you ever collaborate with musicians or get to know them or have any um, particularly close relationships with any musicians? Not, uh, I, I have uh, now. I, when I was uh, coming up, uh, Laurie Anderson was a part of our scene. We were yeah. a part of her scene, whatever. So I, I knew I never collaborated with her or anything like that. I was just, just a, a person, that a friend, and someone I know that I greatly admire and follow. But... Um, I uh, um, I have a, a good friend out here who's a sort of contemporary classic, classical, I guess, contemporary classical composer named Bruce Wallisoff, mm -hmm. who I met because he contacted me about doing a piece uh, based on uh, 
at the time there were three watercolors that I had done that he felt he could shape into something. And in the process of getting to know him and talking about what it, what you know, whatever, I added a fourth uh, watercolor to finish it off. So he he ended up cr creating this piece that is based on that and has been performed several times with the, you know the images in the background and stuff. But that that's a, more or less a, a collaboration where I'm approached having the work con already concrete right. rather than working with somebody to f do something brand new. They're so. responding to your work, which is yeah. cool to see, yeah. isn't it? It's almost like... Yeah, it's, it's very interesting to translate uh, visuals into sound or vice versa. Yeah, but, uh, it's always exciting for me. Like mm -hmm. if I ever work with musicians, I almost like that more in a way to where they respond to the imagery because then you're like, oh, that's the way you imagine this sounds. You know, it's kind of a mm -hmm. fun thing to, to see with what you're doing. Um, the other question I had is what if you, whether it's Europe, wherever you go, if you go to a museum, what's do you have one painting that you just love to see? Well, it ch it changes over time, so I, I get obsessed with something, and then uh, it lasts however long it lasts. So it could be ten years, it could be a year, you know, whatever. Yeah. But uh, I. Um, you know, an example, an old, older example, is a, a painting that uh, a Max Beckman triptych. Oh yeah, I that the modern that. owns. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and it was a painting that for years I, I always liked the way he painted, but I, uh, I I never thought I could use it. I you know his painting manner is so distinct anyway. But uh, I also thought. You know, he's painting these, these you know, incredibly sort of, if not cryptic, at least encrypted narratives yeah. that, you know, I either have to be, a, a, you know, so versed in, in literature and history and whatever, I could, no way could I penetrate the, the significance of these images that are bizarre. Right. And compelling, and and uh, and so I used to walk by this painting, Departure. All, every time I go into the Met, I'd go past it to look for something else. And and one day I stood in front of it, saying, I, "I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna literally talk to myself about it. I'm gonna actually s repeat what I'm seeing, and I'm gonna start on the left panel, and I'm gonna move through it, and I'm just gonna say what I see." And, you know, so you're, I'm standing there going, I'm looking at a painting. There's a guy with a purple and black striped shirt. Are people around watching this? <laughs> uh, they they might have been passing by, right. yeah. But it was something where as I started to talk back, based on what I was seeing, associations happened. You know, the, the this black and purple shirt made me think of of pirates right you know so i i didn't say why i just said okay so maybe he's a pirate and he was swinging something that at first looked like an axe but then it became clear it was a fishnet that he was swinging like an axe and you know then there was this woman who was corseted and tied up like a like a prostitute or something with her arms extended she was bent over a glass uh, ball that was like a, you know, like a, a fortune-telling ball, and there was a newspaper underneath it. You could see the headlines, and so the future is the headlines of the paper. And, you know, it, it was just, I was going on and on. And this painting just started to unfold. And uh, I'd never had that experience uh, before and and so for you know 10 15 years i would seek it out at times and just to go walk through it again and the yeah. pleasure of you know seeing these images and the the images kept expanding depending on where i was you know the interpretation would be slightly different or 
I started noticing other nuances in it. And so to, to answer your question, uh, yeah, there are definitely things that I, you know, if I'm in Florence, there's a Donatella sculpture I go back to see because a, 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 Mary, a wood carving of Mary Magdalene that blew my mind, yeah. and, you know, et cetera. So. It makes a great case for seeing work in person too, because those kind oh, of like to, over yeah. time relationships when you see something, you know, you're kind of lucky if you're in a place that, you know, has something like that. Like when I used to go to the Carnegie Museum, there were a few works as a young person that, you know, you go back and see it again. And I, I keep to this day, I go back and there, you know, there's the Van Gogh there that I always, it's the color that, that just mm -hmm. like hits me. And yeah, that's, I think a great advertisement for. Yeah. I don't know if you, I, I'm sure you've seen it with your students. I've certainly seen it with students and younger artists. The difference between now and then is that they, they receive imagery on all different kinds of machines yes right from from iphones iwatches ipads you know computers televisions cinema billboards billboards yeah, yeah. right so what i find in their paintings is they don't actually have a sense of scale to the object right they have a they have a sense of size and, you know, they make paintings that are small, medium, large, extra large, which is, you know, more of a, a product-based yeah. a mentality, a market-based mentality. A menu item. <laughs> yeah. But, what they, but part of that is because of the absence of, of firsthand knowledge of how an object absolutely affects your physicality. How, how you go into the presence of a painting and somatically experience it. You, you feel enlarged or shrunken. You feel tense or loose. You, you, know, you have all these different physical responses while you're standing there connecting to an object. Yeah. And that, that's what great art does. It, right. it actually takes control of your body. And uh, and I think for a very specific reason, which has to do with the the experience the artist is trying to uh, share with you, right? Um, and I think that that's one of the things that I have a big question mark about where where do we go from here when that becomes uh, less of an interest, less of, a, of an ambition, less of an experience, you know, is it, does it matter? You know, there's certainly gonna be new languages created, but. Uh, yeah, not anyway. to bring it full circle, but tilt brush, I think we, come, we brought it home. <laughs> yeah. We'll just go into the virtual world, build three-dimensional yeah. objects that we walk around with in virtual reality or something. It's, yeah, yeah who knows where it goes. Well, uh, you know, as we were saying about uh, tilt brush, I don't know if you were recording that at the time we were. No, I wasn't. That was pre. It wasn't. But uh, one one of the things I like about my experience in virtual reality, and and there was a a woman that I met who had grown up in a family. Her father was a hyper realist painter. She grew up with the skill set of a hyper realist. Uh, she went to uh, UCLA graduate school and, and they s sort of stripped her of painting and she moved into the digital realm to Photoshop stuff and whatnot and eventually came out of there and hooked up with a, a company that makes uh, uh, virtual reality experiences. Yeah and uh, immersive experiences. And she was the sort of chief designer, uh, uh, renderer of these magical spaces that they were creating. And she was telling me how her, her you know, skill set and knowledge of hyper-realism came full circle in, in the way she made the programs 
the design, the algorithms, made the programs that would be able to render with acute detail, right? Right. And she was doing these uh, uh, immersive experiences that were um, sort of fantasy realms. A lot of it were mo old movie tropes, uh, you know, sort of Harry Potter things or Men in Black or... You know, it was variations on, on movie tropes. Right. But uh, what I, when I went into her world, you know, virtually, and, and was experiencing these things, I could care less about the story. Right. What was blowing my mind was to see this virtual leaf on a tree or this, you know, the way she rendered this or that that was was so engaging that I, I found myself saying, I, why don't they just make a virtual reality space in which y there's no story. Y you right. just walk in and see the, and have your mind blown by this incredible place, right? And, and one of the things that I was, you and I were talking about in terms of tilt brush, one of the things that I like about tilt brush, even though I think it's a relatively primitive painting tool, is that it puts you in a space where your body knows that it's in two different places simultaneously. Yeah. And because of that confusion, you become hyper aware of, of everything. Right. And, and that that's, creates a sense of wonder and a sense of awe. And I, I think that's the thing that <clears throat> we need to be constantly revitalized by reminded of as artists yes definitely it's like where where do we go to to get awe right. you know <clears throat> and hopefully excuse me hopefully in your studio you can recreate awe for yourself first and then for others but uh but that should be the ultimate ambition and in, in terms of how to engage a, a, a rapt crowd you know definitely yeah that's that's a great way to wrap it up because i feel like that's that's kind of like what we're you know trying to do every time you know what i mean is, is to create mm -hmm. that that feeling so um yeah listen, especially on a good day yeah right <laughs> <laughs> it's not always that magical in the studio <laughs> it definitely is most often not yeah, yeah even the <laughs> on, commute the, over on the road to magical right right <laughs> yeah the magical commute over to bushwick is not always that that's <laughs> that a bright light that beacon but you just got to do it you got to make the you got to do it you got to sure. put in the hours yeah well, listen, thanks. It was very kind of you to take this time out, and I really enjoyed talking. And the book, which is called Bad Boy, was like a, it, it was a really great read. I mean, I, I really enjoyed it. Well, I appreciate it. you reading it. I don't take that for granted, especially as someone who's not a very good reader. So, yeah, as it's, I am. Oh, I that, thought you were uh, <laughs> When someone reads a book, it's like, wow, you read a book. Yeah. Yeah, I, we feel that way when people look at our work, you know, and you're like, oh, you went to my show. That's so nice. But then when you, when it's a book, you know, it's a different kind of commitment. And uh, yeah, but it yeah. was a page turn. I mean, I read it pretty quickly. Like I, I went okay. through it, which was good. And um, but yeah, it was very kind of you to take the time and I really appreciate it. It was great meeting sure. you. Sure. Well, thank you for asking me. I appreciate that. Thanks. <laughs> Hey, episode 300. Thank you all for 